Hans Kuhn passed away on April 6th. He was a theological advisor at Vatican Council II, and he wrote the Declaration Toward a Global Ethic adopted at the Parliament of World Religions in Chicago in 93 and 2018. We will discuss Han Kuhn's efforts toward a world religion and a world government on today's edition of End of the Age. You're listening to an End of the Age Encore presentation. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dave Robbins with End Time Ministries. Thank you for joining me on this edition of End of the Age. We're going to go back through some history today, and then we'll bring you back up to where we're at right now and show you what's going on in the world from a prophetic perspective. Years ago, it's been probably, I'm going to say, close to 20 years ago now, Irvin Baxter interviewed a man named Robert Mueller. He was the Assistant Secretary General to the Secretary General of the United Nations. We interviewed him when our radio program was called Politics and Religion. Many of you will remember that. He stated to Irvin on the program, and I'm quoting, Irvin, we have brought to the world together as far as we can politically. Now, he's talking about a world government, the United Nations. We brought the world together as far as we can politically to bring about a true world government, which is the goal in all of this. The world must be brought together spiritually. We need a United Nations of religions. And again, Robert Mueller told Irvin Baxter that years ago. So Robert Mueller, uh, moving on, Robert Mueller understood that the ultimate goal of internationalists around the globe is a, a totally compliant world governing system. An, an organization designed to supersede any national government and demand that every person surrender their sovereignty and submit their uh, to international laws and regulations. Now, in everything I'm telling you today, remember that. Keep this as the... Um, the core, that keep this in, in your mind as I'm talking about Hans Kuhn, everything he did for world religion, the goal of all of these individuals was a world government. So Robert Mueller, he also knew that for his dream of a world government to become a reality, that all religions must somehow ignore their differences, regardless of what they were, small or huge in many cases, and that they would need to unify, pledge their allegiance to the establishment of the global community, this world governing body. And when that happened, um, and according to Bible prophecy, it will in the very near future, it's actually in the process of being established now, that those who choose not to conform will be considered heretics, and many of them would pay for it with their life. You can read about that. Revelation chapter 13. So just a little more history, and then I'll bring you up to where we're at right now. At the Parliament of World's Religions held in Chicago back in 93. Now, the first one was held in 1893. So at the 100-year anniversary in 93, Parliament of World's Religions, they invited Catholics, Protestants, um, Hindus, Jews, Muslims, Sikhs, Astorians, uh, Wiccans, which are witches, indigenous people, I mean, every religion you can think of, and, and many others. They adopted a global ethic that was authored by eminent um, Catholic theologian Hans Kung. And I'm saying Kung, K U N G, Kung. So, a global ethic, that's a belief system. And they came up with this, hey, we want a global belief system. We don't, want, we don't want many different parallel belief systems. We don't want all that. 
We want a global belief system that everybody buys into for the sake of a world order, a sustainable world order. And I'll show you that here in just a moment. So the essence of this global ethic can be captured in just a few quotes from that document. Number one, it's stated, and I'm quoting, we affirm that a common set of core values is found in the teachings of the religions and that these form the basis for a global ethic, a global belief system, that there is a core value in every religion, no matter how far out there it is, that there's a, a global ethic that we can all kind of agree on that all religions can agree upon. Number two, there already exist ancient guidelines for human behavior, which are found in the teachings of these religions, all the religions of the world. Here it is, which are the condition for a sustainable world order. So that's their goal. A world government is the goal in all of this. Always remember that throughout the rest of my program. Remember, world government is the goal. It's prophesied about 2,000 years ago. Actually, all of this was, but I want you to get this. And then number three, Hans Kuhn said in the global ethic, hey, we need to sink our narrow differences. Now, when you talk about all the religions of the world, would you consider them narrow differences? Just a, oh, you know, something we can just brush under the rug. You know, some people, some religions worship thousands of gods. A Christian worships one God. A Jew worships one God. So narrow differences? We need to sink our narrow differences? Why should we do that? Well, Hans Kuhn said in the global ethic, we need to sink our narrow differences for the cause of the world community, a world government, practicing a culture of solidarity and relatedness. So there's world government speak all through, interwoven through this document. And this terminology, sustainable world order, or sinking our narrow differences, that's very alarming. And this, this document has not gone away. <clears throat> They're celebrating it this year in October at the, uh, I think it's the eighth meeting of the Parliament of World's Religion to be held on October 17th and 18th. They're going to be saying, hey, Hans Kuhn has passed away on, on uh, I think it was March, April 6th, but yet his do the document he put together, this global ethic, we're still celebrating that. We're going to push on and make this thing happen. But think about this, the narrow differences. Do the narrow differences that we are supposed to sink include beliefs about whether or not Jesus is God? I mean, to a Christian, that's the most important thing, right? But there's a lot of people that are saying, hey, well, let's just, let's not talk about Jesus. We can talk about God and that will include everybody, right? Because everybody serves some kind of a God. But what is the name of that God? That's a big difference. That's what separates everything out here. And so that's what we're going to talk about the remainder of the program. God bless. For centuries, the symbols and prophecies within the book of Revelation have perplexed Christians and unbelievers around the world. In his final work, Revelation, The Unveiling of Jesus Christ Part 2, the late Irvin Baxter unlocks the mystery of the book of Revelation with in-depth analysis and commentary like you've never heard before. The second half of this 21-part definitive DVD series and 260-plus page comprehensive commentary book covers the last half of the book of Revelation. You'll walk away with complete understanding and peace about the events happening during the final years on Earth. These comprehensive study tools, available for $299, will deepen your biblical understanding as you dig into the original intention of the book. When you call 1-800-END-TIME or go online right now to order, you can also get the entire commentary, including parts one and two, for $499. Don't miss this special offer. 1-800-END-TIME or go to endtime.com. We've seen Bible prophecy fulfilled like never before. From the halls of the United Nations to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, End Time Ministries continues to reveal the Bible prophecy in the news headlines around the world every day. 
whether it's through our broadcast or online at our Jerusalem Prophecy College, your gifts enable us to put vital materials in the hands of those who need it most. Because of you, we continue to replace fear with faith in the hearts of Christians around the world. We will continue to see prophecy come to pass at an even swifter pace. We need your support. Your donation of any amount enables us to continue to broadcast and be a voice in the ever-growing censored media. To become a partner or give a one-time gift, visit endtime.com or call 1-800-END-TIME right now. That's 800-363-8463. Go online now. Visit endtime.com. You're listening to an End of the Age Encore presentation. You know, everyone, this is, this is a huge statement in this global eth ethic uh, document put up by Hans Kuhn years ago. Because when he says you need to sink our narrow differences between all these religions, again, whether or not Jesus was God or whether we should worship Allah as God. A lot of people say that they believe in God, but... Who is your God? How do you define your God? What do you call your God? It's very, very important, right? I mean, Jehovah as God or Brahma as God? I mean, he said we need to sink these narrow differences for the cause of the world community and a one world government. The philosophy of this global ethic is what drives interfaithism. And so Mr. Hans Kuhn had previously penned the global ethic that stated that we must sink the narrow differences that keep us apart so that we can, in fact, form a global community. And he said, hey, when, if there's, there's going to be no peace in, in uh, politics, no peace among nations until there is peace among religions. So he set out to somehow form a peace among religions. And he said, to do that, let's just push our narrow differences aside. But they're not narrow. If you're really trying to serve the Lord, do His will, understand the Bible, these are not narrow differences. These are Grand Canyon, really. So, the dream of a one world government, I always want to make sure I keep that at the forefront. And this one world religion was, it's progressing towards reality. We're watching it happening right now. And it was the culmination of the interfaith movement. It's really moving forward very fastly right now. Uh, again, October 17th and 18th this year, the 8th Parliament of World's Religions is going to gather the world's global interfaith movements together um, and celebrate the enduring spirit and work of religious and spiritual communities striving toward a more just, peaceful, and sustainable world. Whenever you hear sustainability, sustainable world, things like that right now, they're talking about global governance of the world. They'll say that, oh, we're not, uh, we're consuming too much goods and um, too much uh, of the earth's resources. We're not leaving anything for future generations. But really, that's just the smoke and mirrors that you see in the news. What they're really trying to do is to govern every individual on the planet. This is the United Nations effort, and I'll show you that in just a moment. Now, they actually say on the Parliament of World's Religions website for the upcoming October dates that the programming for the 2021 Parliament will focus largely on, number one, the broad critical issues of our mission statement, justice, peace, and sustainability, including climate action. That is all United Nations propaganda, okay? That's their number one thing, and it's all United Nations propaganda to redistribute the wealth of the world. That's what the Paris Climate Agreement is all about. They're getting everybody trying to scare you to death to get you to be willing to yield up your sovereignty to this one world governing body. That's all this is about. Number two they say that the signature document of the Parliament of World's Religions, this declaration toward a global ethic that was written by Hans Kuhn, we want to focus on that in this huge meeting that's coming up in October. 
So it's a parliament of world's religions, but yet they're pushing, they've adopted, and they're pushing still, even after his passing away, this global ethic where they're trying to get the religions of the world together and, and to sink their narrow differences for the cause of a world community or a world government. This is Bible Prophecy 101, the formation of a world religion and a world government. And the world religion would be formed with the sole goal to propagate or to advocate for this world governing body. Now, there were some individuals that were writing in a Berkeley forum, and I want to quote to you very influential people. I want to quote to you what they're saying about Hans Kung in this global ethic. Um, Kika Shambasu, she's the founder and president of the Green Hope Foundation. She writes that Hans Kung and a global ethic, a route to building back better. You heard uh, President Biden just talked about that at the G7 conference. You've heard the United Nations talking about build back better. It's, it's global governance. It's all it is. Hey, in, after this crisis, we need to build back better in the world that they, the supposed globalist intelligentsia of society, build back better in the, in the, uh, the form of a world that they want. It's what it's all about. It really comes down to more control. So, this lady says that, and I'm quoting, Dr. Kuhn's vision is timeless and intergenerational. And although he is not present in person, his thoughts continue to provide us with the fuel for creating a new world order. One that is based on a global ethic of humanity. And so these, all these individuals, they know exactly what they're talking about, exactly what Hans Kuhn's goal was. World government, but to have that, we've got to get the religions of the world. Somehow we've got to bring them together and in one global mindset that really is willing to support this world governing body. Audrey E. Katagawa, she's the president and founder of the International Academy for Multicultural Cooperation. She's the president of Light of Awareness Inter International Spiritual Family. And she's a UN representative for the United Nations or the United Religions Initiative, founded by Bishop Swing, the URI. And she writes that the declaration recognize the declaration of Hans Kung, this global ethic, it recognized the existence of ancient guidelines for human behavior, which are found in the teachings of the religions of the world which are the condition for a sustainable world order, world government. So they know exactly what they're talking about, the goals they're trying to hit, and they're all working together. And, the, and at this future meeting in October that's coming up to Parliament of World's Religions, this is the document that they are going to be celebrating and making sure that they spend time on one. It's one of the major focuses of the entire meeting. We need a global ethic for the cause of a world order. So the dream of this, this interfaith world religious system has not died. And let me tell you, this interfaith um, religious system that's being formed, it's been being formed for years, but there are religions here in the United States that are buying into this. This is something in the end time that you absolutely will not want to be a part of because you're, 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 it's going right in and it's advocating for the world government. And the Antichrist and the false prophet will run these two entities, this world government and this world religion. And again, this is all spelled out very precisely in Revelation chapter 13. This is something you absolutely will not want to be a part of. You say, well, I don't know if I'm a part of it or not. My church, you know, I just go to church on Sundays and, uh, you know, we have socials and this, that, and the other. And I'm just a member of a church. Well, you should check on your church board, your general board that's over the whole thing. Make sure, are, do they believe in interfaith? Are they signing documents of justification with these interfaith movements? Are they participating in this? If they are... I would not do that, okay? I'm just telling you. 
This is something you will not want to be a part of throughout the end time. Now, another point of interest that you may not have known was that Hans Kuhn was a theological advisor back at Vatican Council II. Vatican Council II was um, 1962 to 65, okay? You said, well, what was, what's the big deal about Vatican Council II? Well, Vatican Council II was part of this huge interfaith movement and different things. Vatican II was a call to unite. And um, Pope Francis is very much an advocate for Vatican Council II and what happened there. So, you say, well, what happened? Well, after Vatican Council II, the Catholic Church issued two documents that called for a new era of interfaith and ecumenical relations. And that calls very much alive today, believe me. This is part of it. Because, again, remember Hans Kuhn, who wrote this declaration for a global ethic, he was a, an advisor at Vatican II. So in essence, the uh, Catholic Church no longer saw itself in opposition to other faiths. I mean, prior to Vatican II, really, if you were not Catholic, then they considered you, the, the Catholic Church considered you hellbound. But there came a time at Vatican II where they said, hey, you know, we've got to kind of change up here. We've isolated everybody. And so we've got to issue these two documents. This is what happened at Vatican II. The goal was to seek a common ground between the Catholic Church and other Christian denominations that had broke off as a result of the Reformation, as well as other religions. So the first document was Unitatis Red Gratio, which is the decree on ecumenism. It was in uh, 1964, and it issued a call for the unity of all Christian, uh, quote-unquote, Christian churches. The second decree was Nostra Aetate. You can read these. You can go online and read the whole thing. The declaration on... Now, it's like reading an encyclopedia, I'll just tell you. <laughs> but you can go online and read both of them. The declaration on... This was the declaration on the relation of the church to non-Christian religions. That was in 1965. And Hans Kuhn was involved in all of this. And for the first time, it encouraged interreligious dialogue with the Catholic Church. And as previously stated, this is an effort by the Catholic Church to unite all the religious, every religious entity, both Christian and non-Christian. But the question is why? The goal isn't to bring Protestants and those of other religions to salvation. Uh, we know this because the church is declaring that these people are already saved. I mean, for instance, the new Catholic catechism issued in 1994 it states that Muslims are saved. I picked one of these up uh, in a half-price bookstore the other day and took a picture of this actual statement in there. Um, they actually state, and I'm quoting out of this Catholic catechism, the church's relationship with the Muslims. Uh, the, the plan of salvation also includes those who acknowledge the Creator in the first place amongst whom are the Muslims. These profess to hold the faith of Abraham, and together with us they adore the one merciful God, mankind's judge on the last day. However, you understand that Muslims deny that Jesus was God or that he died on the cross. So when um, Hans Kuhn is talking about narrow differences, like I said, that's not a narrow difference. That's a Grand Canyon, folks. We're diametrically, if you're a Christian and you don't believe Jesus died on the cross, you need, there's some scriptures in the Bible that we need to go over. Because our entire, the essence of our Christian belief system, our plan of salvation goes back to Calvary and the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you don't believe in that, then, you know, J Jerusalem Prophecy College, <laughs> into the age plus, I mean, because you, that's, that's, that is Christianity 101. That's the first class. You've got to understand salvation. But remember, the global leaders, they see the, the unification of the religions of the world. Remember what Robert Mueller told Irvin Baxter years ago on politics and religion. 
He said, Irvin, we've done it. We've brought this world government as far as we can politically. We've got to get the religions of the world on board with this or it's never going to happen. And so they've been making strides, huge strides, toward getting the religions under one global belief system, one global ethic, which is what Hans Kuhn wrote, and to get people on board with this world governing body. Remember, he said, we need to sink our narrow differences for the cause of the world community, this sustainable world order. So you remember, the, the global leaders, they see unification of the religions of the world as a solution to global religious conflicts. Uh, Gorbachev stated in his book, Perestroika, years ago, there are three root causes for conflicts on the earth. Conflicts between nations, political conflicts, and, and um, economic conflicts, religious conflicts, and um, political conflicts. And so the goal to solve, the um, solution to that was that we would just form a world religious system. You say, well, but there's no way. Some of these, most of these religions are diametrically opposed to each other's belief systems. Some of them are Wiccans, that, which are witches. Some of them worship trees and rocks and the sun and the moon. And how are you going to marry that with somebody who's a Christian who worships the God of the Bible? So at this point, conflicting doctrines in the eyes of the individuals that want to form this interfaith movement, these doctrines are seen as stumbling blocks to the ultimate goal of a world government. And that's why Hans Kuhn said, hey, we need to just sink our narrow differences. We won't pay any attention to those. Let's just all come together in kind of like a, a, a kumbaya, kumbaya type situation where let's all come together, have tolerance and love for everybody. And if you've got a difference in religion, let's not even talk about that. Major internet companies are silencing and censoring Christian voices online. These companies are trying to control what you see and hear. Almost 200 videos of ours have been marked as restricted online right now. That's why we launched End of the Age Plus, a platform where the truth won't be censored, a platform where we can preach the message of the gospel. When you subscribe to End of the Age Plus today for just $12.99 a month, you can watch all of our content in a secure, easy-to-view way from your favorite device. When you go to watch.endtime.com and subscribe, you'll get instant access to all of our teaching resources, including Revelation, the Unveiling of Jesus Christ, Understanding the End Time, End Time Magazine, and so much more. We will not censor our message to comply with what the world deems as politically correct. Go to watch.endtime.com right now or search End of the Age Plus in the App Store or Google Play. Move Mountains with Irvin Baxter. This book by Irvin's grandson provides 30 days of devotion that will enhance your relationship with God and others. Authentic illustrations from early morning devotions at end time will help you find your purpose and eliminate fears. Commit to taking this 30-day journey and experience real life change. Get your book for only $14.99. Call 1-800-363-8463 or go to endtime.com slash move. If your station only carries the first 30 minutes of End of the Age, go to endtime.com and click the watch button to continue today's broadcast. You can also finish up later by clicking the archive button. You're listening to an End of the Age Encore presentation. You know, folks, Irvin Baxter has been talking about this for 25, 30 years. And a lot of people will say, well, man, I used to hear Irvin Baxter talk about this world religious system and everything, but I kind of wondered where it was at, uh, what was going on with it. It's m marching straight forward at a pace it's hard to almost keep up with, everybody. And these Parliament of World Religion, these interfaith movements, these things are happening all around the world just all the time. They're meeting and having an interfaith prayer meeting here, and this organization is being started. I mean, we're, it's like a steamroller, and it is progressing very quickly now because they're trying to get this world government 
fully established and they know that they've got to bring the religions of the world on board. Because here's why, let me tell you, one of the main reasons is because when the world government comes out with a scare tactic, human-induced global warming, which leads to climate change. Well, people that trust in God, they don't really worry about that because they say, hey, you know, all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose, right? That's what a Christian believes. So I'm not, you know, whatever happens, I mean, I'll, I'll pray about it. I trust in God and I go on. That's the way I live my life. So when the world government comes out with all this scary propaganda about human-induced global warming, which leads to climate change, yes, I do research that. I know all about that. But it's propaganda. It's a scare tactic. So I don't get scared. Don't go around it. The Bible says God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. So, but the, the gov world government doesn't want that. They don't want me turning to God and saying, God, help us in time of need. They want us looking to the world government for the solution or the, um, the, the, the solution to the world's problems or in time of crises. They want us looking to the world government, not to our individual, to, as a Christian, to God for help. So this is what the world religious system is all about, is getting people on board and supporting the world government. That's why they're tying the sustainable development goals and the climate uh, and the ecology and all this stuff into it because they want even Christian individuals, all these religions, they're saying that, hey, you're sinning against the environment if you continue to use so much resources and you know, overconsumption and all of this. Well, in a Christian's mind, when you say sin, then, hey, it's like ding, 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 uh, sin. I know that's a bad thing. But is me using resources of the earth, which God can replenish just by thinking about it or speaking it. I mean, we, they, they say, oh, we're going to run out of fossil fuels and oil and all this other stuff. Folks, God created the oil that's in the earth now. You think he can't create more? It's very simple. God told us to occupy till he comes. He's not going to allow us to run out of resources. That's not going to happen. But yet the world government needs, a scare, it needs this, um, a, a perpetual scare tactic to keep everybody in fear mode. So then they'll look to the world government for, and they'll say, hey, we're the solution. We need more government, more control, because you're using too much of the resources of the earth. And so you're the bad person and we're the good people and we know how to manage it. So look to us for the solution, but we're going to have to tax you and we're going to have to do this, redistribute the wealth of the world. It's all a big scam. That's what's going on right now. And so Donald Trump realized that. That's why he pulled us out of the Paris Climate Agreement. All it was was a huge wealth redistribution scheme. And of course, President Biden is a globalist. He pushes us right back into it. And so uh, if, if I have time tomorrow, I'll try to get off into the Build Back Better stuff that Joe Biden talked about when he was over there uh, at the G7 summit. It's just, it's just crazy. But this is the reason for the world religious stuff going on right now, the, the, the bringing together of the world's religions. That's the quest that you see going on for this unification of religions, and it's being promoted today. And listen, everybody. This is a 2,000-year-old prophecy, and it's coming to pass right before our very eyes. The Bible prophesies um, a, the establishment of a global religious system in the end time. Um, according to Scripture, the, the leader of this deceitful organization, and it is going to be deceptive, everybody, because it's all built on a lie. It's built on propaganda. And anybody that would say to the world's religions, well, let's just sink our narrow differences for the cause of a world government. I mean, come on. That, that's not based on the truth, number one, because you could never say to an individual, hey, just sink your, uh, an individual that's a Christian, 
Just sink your narrow differences on the belief in one God and let's just all, you know, let's form unions and different things and join with these people that ha believe in thousands of gods but yet believe they could go to heaven. It's never going to work like that. Not to a true Christian. It's not going to happen. It would never happen. I'm a Christian man. And I could never say to an individual who worships the rocks, yeah, you'll make it to heaven because that's not based on scripture. My belief system comes straight from the word of God and the doctrines in the Bible. And we hold to them doctrines. The Bible says hold to them doctrines because in doing so, you'll save yourself and them that hear you. My goal, everybody, is to get people to heaven. It's not to be popular. It's not to be um, to conform to this world government or world religion. I'm trying to get people to heaven. And so I've got to say, no, I, I can't conform to that because it goes against the Bible. I cannot conform to anything that is anti-Bible, everybody. And this is what's going to separate those that go to heaven and those that don't is the ones that are willing to adhere to the Bible. So it's going to be a deceitful organization and it's going to have two objectives. The leader is going to have two goals. His goal is going to be to unite the world's religions under this belief system of tolerance. Just everybody get along. Don't try to proselytize people. Don't try to teach them the word of God because they may believe something else and you might step on their toes or you might offend them or, you know, you got to do it in love. I've won a lot of people to the Lord. But you got to do it in love. You start just going in like a bulldozer in a, in a china shop and yeah, you're going to have problems. But in love, you share the gospel of the kingdom of God with people. And those people that are sincere, they'll say, you know what? You're right. That's the word of God. I can't deny it. Tell me what I got to do. That's our goal, to share the gospel of the kingdom of God to this entire world. You say, well, what's the gospel of the kingdom of God? Very simple. The same message that Jesus taught, the same message the apostles taught, that's what we teach. The God of heaven is coming back before very long to establish his kingdom here on the earth. Let me show you what the Bible says the plan of salvation is to be a part of that kingdom. That's it. And then you just tell people, hey, I can prove to you using prophecy, God's coming back before very long. How you know it's not before very long? Because we're living off in the end time right now. I use prophecy to do that. And then I say, let me show you how to be a part of that kingdom. It's coming. It's right around the corner. So would you like to be a part of the kingdom? Yes. Here's what the Bible says you need to do. It's really simple. And I know that people around for decades and hundreds and thousands of years have been trying to pollute it, but it's really, really a simple message. And, but this end time world religious system, it's going to say, well, hold on a minute. You you believe you're the only one that has the words to eternal life. I don't have the words to eternal life. The Bible does. And so I'm saying that yes, the Bible, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the father, but by me. Period. That's what the Bible says. That's what we're going to go with. I can't conform to this world religious system because it's going to be based on tolerance. And then the, this world religious leader, he's coming into power in the near future. He's going to use this pious position to influence all adherents to align with and pledge allegiance to the prophesied world government. Can you see how that's happening right now? in this global ethic that they will be celebrating at the Parliament of World's Religions in October, one of their main things they're going to focus on is the global ethic, the, the um, declaration of her global ethic that Hans Kuhn pinned and that it says, let's just sink our narrow differences for the cause of a world government. You know, recent events... There are things that are happening all the time. They confirm what we who really have been studying the, and analyze the Bible prophecy for years have already known. This world religion is in the latter stages of its formation and the world's most recognized religious leader is already. Now, I'm not saying he's the false prophet, 
but he's already beseeching the world to commit and adhere to the global governing efforts of the United Nations, which is the seat of world government in the earth today. Who's the mastermind behind all of this? The mastermind behind all of this is not Pope Francis. Revelation 13 provides really a snapshot of Satan's plan to establish his kingdom on the earth in the end time. If you look at it, Revelation 13, 1 through 8 describes the one world government and the leader of that entity, which we would commonly refer to him as the Antichrist. Revelation 13, 2 states, and the dragon gave this entity its power, seat, and great authority. The dragon, Satan, who is the mastermind behind the current effort to govern the earth. Revelation 12, 9 explains this. It says, and, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, the devil, and Satan. And then Revelation 13, 7 tells us that the world, that it's going to be a world government because the Bible says, and power was given over him, over him all over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. So there's the world government and the Antichrist. But then you move right into Revelation 13, 11 through 15, and that describes the world religion and the leader of that entity referred to in Revelation 19, 20 as the false prophet. And then, of course, Revelation 13, 16 through 18 describes the Antichrist economic sanctioning system which is going to be used to financially force individuals into conformity, commonly referred to as the mark of the beast. So, the prophesied world religion. Jesus actually prophesied concerning the end time that religious leaders would deceive many with their false teachings, didn't he? In Matthew 24, they asked Jesus, what's going to be the sign of your coming of the end of the age? Jesus said, take heed that no man deceive you. For many will come in my name saying, hey, I'm a Christian religious leader and saying I am Christ, but they're going to deceive many. That's what Matthew 24, 4 through 5. So deception will be the method used by the false prophet to create this one world religious system. And although the, religious, the, the world religion is mentioned in other scriptures, I want to focus on the prophecy found in Revelation 13, 11 through 15. I want you to understand where we get this teaching from. And so I'll, I'll be going through these verses um, just on the other side of the break because I want to break this down. I want you to know when we talk about world religion, where do we get that from in the Bible? How can I explain it? Uh, how do we know it's coming to pass right now? Well, I just explained to you how it's coming to pass, but when we get back, I'll show you where it's found in scripture and I'll walk you through it. Most of us walk around day by day blind to the prophecies being fulfilled right before us. Every news report brings a new piece to the puzzle in the race towards the final seven years and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, more than ever, it is important for God's people to understand the times in which we are living. On November the 12th, 2013, we opened our Jerusalem Prophecy College in downtown Jerusalem. These same courses are now available online for people who are unable to attend the classes in person. We welcome students to join us and discover the link between current events and the prophecies of the Bible. Take your place in the prophecy of Daniel 11:33. Enroll in the Jerusalem Prophecy College today. Go to JerusalemProphecyCollege.com. You're listening to an End of the Age Encore presentation. So <clears throat> you might be sitting there saying, well, well the Revelation, I mean, uh, the it talks about all kinds of prophecies. How do you guys get a, a world religion and the leader of that world religion from prophecy? Okay. Revelation chapter 13, verse 11 through 15. And it says, um, and I beheld. So the first beast is talking about the world government and the Antichrist. Then John said, hey, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb. And he spake like the dragon. Remember the dragon is, that's Satan. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him. And here's his goal. 
it says, and he causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship or pledge allegiance to the Antichrist or the world government whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives these individuals, everybody around the earth, that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. And he says to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast and that they should, uh, that was wounded by a sword and did live. That's talking about, that's an, another conversation, but it's talking about the tearing down of the Berlin Wall. I'll teach you about that on another program. But the Bible says, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak this image of this Antichrist figure and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast, that they should be killed. So quite an ominous prophecy, right? But it's from these set of scriptures that we learn many things about the end time world religion. Number one, if you go back to verse 11, it says, and he had two horns like a lamb, he spake like a dragon. So when we read about the lamb in scripture, most of us think about, hey, Jesus Christ, the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, right? Most times it is referring to him. However, this beast will look like a lamb, but he speaks like a dragon. Remember, the dragon is Satan. So this second beast is going to resemble Jesus, a religious leader, but speak like the devil, a message of deception, lies. And the leader of this world religious system, the false prophet, will be the most recognized religious leader on the planet. There will be millions of people that absolutely trust everything he says. Secondly, and I'm, I'm breaking down these verses here. We're going to analyze these. In Ver, uh, Revelation 13, 12, it says, And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast. So the pro false prophet's ulterior motive will be to use his global influence to unite the religions of the world and then to cause them to worship or pledge allegiance to the Antichrist or his world governing system. I'm telling you, it's, it's happening right now. The, ind the individuals that are at the head of these religious movements, it may I can't say that it's them for sure, but there will come an individual on the scene before very long who will be this false prophet figure. He's going to be in complete alliance with the Antichrist. Revelation 13, 15, it really divulges the extreme measures that the false prophet will use to coerce obedience to the Antichrist persecution. And really, the Bible actually says some people will be persecuted to death. And this political and religious persecution is going to occur during that final three and one half years prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's the time that we would know as the Great Tribulation. So although we have not entered that prophesied era of persecution yet, efforts are being made to unite the religions of the world and to align these organizations with the propaganda of the world government. You, you remember Mr. Kung's uh, statement. He said, there already exist ancient guidelines for human behavior which are found in the teachings of the religions of the world and which are the condition for a sustainable world order. Now, he wrote this uh, well, well over 25 years ago, and he was talking about a sustainable world order back then. So they had the, they've had this thing in view for decades now. On, um, back on October 8th, 2020, the UN Environment Program, or UNEP, and the Parliament of World's Religions, you say, well, what's the United Nations and... The Parliament of World Religions, what are they doing working together? It's all a grand scheme, everybody. They released, back on October 8th, they released a new book called Faith for the Earth. Oh, it's a call for action. What's their mission? Listen to this very, very closely. I'm quoting. They say, we want to encourage, empower, and engage with faith-based, now this is the United Nations, UNEP. We want to engage with faith-based organizations as partners at all levels toward achieving the sustainable development goals and fulfilling the Agenda 2030. 
uh, folks, I, I'm not making this up. The Bible says there's going to be a world government and that there would be a world religious system that's created. And the only reason for the creation of that is to get folks to pledge allegiance to the world governing body. So this statement here says, hey, we want to get the, we want to work with faith-based organizations. They're working with the Parliament of World's Religions, which is the, one of the biggest interfaith entities on the planet. We're working with these faith-based inter, inter, um, interfaith movements. What's the goal? To implement the sustainable development goals. When you hear the term sustainable development goals, that is synonymous with world government. The sustainable development goals, they were um, unanimously adopted by 193 member states of the United Nations, including the United States under the Obama administration back on September 25th, 2015. These goals make up the, the international community's 15-year socialistic blueprint of global governance for every person on the planet. That's the sustainable development goals. They are everywhere, everything. The World Economic Forum, the uh, President Biden, Europe, everybody is pointing back towards the Council for Inclusive Capitalism, which is ran by the Rothschild lady in union with the, that she says, the moral guidance of Pope Francis, where they brought together some of the major businesses on the planet. I'm talking about fabulously, it's untold wealth. They say we're working together with the World Economic Forum to implement the Sustainable Development Goals. Everything goes back to the Sustainable Development Goals. Why? That's the, that's the agenda of the United Nations to globally govern every human on the planet by 2030. You understand we're in 2021. So it's not a thousand years away. So the plan is aptly named Transforming Our World, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And the goals are a, a universal policy agenda designed to convert the nations of the world into a global community that answers to the United Nations. That's governed by the United Nations. And it's, it's comprised of 17 goals and 169 focused targets designed to govern you and to govern me. Now, I say it's socialistic. I've said this many times. But it's socialistic because their plan includes the socialistic principle of wealth redistribution. Stating that, you know, reduction of this inequality will be the only only going to be possible <clears throat> if wealth is shared and income inequality is addressed. Wealth redistribution. That's what the Paris Climate Agreement was all about. Again, that's why Paris, uh, President Trump pulled us out of it. They were siphoning money out of the United States like you cannot imagine. But I also refer to it as global governance because uh, of every person on the earth because the plan actually states we commit to making fundamental changes in the way that our societies produce and consume goods they want to tell you how to run your business, in other words, and services and governments and uh, international organizations, the business sector and other non-state actors and individuals must contribute to changing unsustainable consumption and production patterns. So there, th this is just a ruse. The ruse is that humans are using the earth's resources at such a rate that nothing will be left for future generations. Therefore, the United Nations, this world government, must establish a master plan to govern the Earth's citizens. That's what the Sustainable Development Goal is. That's their master plan. Agenda 2030. And so what's it going to do? Well, number one, in true socialistic form, they want to redistribute the wealth of the world so everyone is considered equal. Number two, control the production and consumption of every person. Number three, strive to achieve universal health care. You've heard that. And anybody that wants universal health care, globalist. They want to control the climate, manage our cities and infrastructure, govern the oceans, 
and govern land usage along with all ecosystems. Folks, this is the Sustainable Development Goals. This is world government. And don't ever let anybody tell you different. The Sustainable Development Goals, synonymous term, world government. So the World Government Alliance. Remember, Bible prophecy foretells the world's most recognized religious leader is going to fully support the world government and will lead other religions to adhere to its mandates in the end time. Uh, on uh, March 8, 2019, Pope Francis affirmed the importance of uh, meeting the Sustainable Development Goals while he was speaking at the International Conference on Religions and the Sustainable Development Goals, listening to the cry of the earth and the poor. I mean, the title really is misleading. I mean, it should have been called the International Conference on Religions and World Government because that's what it was all about. But that would just be too obvious, right? So during Pope Francis' speech, he made a few key statements. He said, different religious traditions, including the Catholic tradition, have embraced the objectives of sustainable development because they are the result of the global participatory process. So he's fully advocating for the Sustainable Development Goals. But hold on. What are the Sustainable Development Goals? The socialistic blueprint to run the world. And by, up before 2030, especially since the popes for decades have called now for a global governing body to manage the planet. You understand that all of the popes from pretty much from Vatican II on, Every single one of them has advocated for a world governing body. Some of them would call it, we need a general form of public authority. We need a universal public authority. We need the establishment of a world authority. We, you know, we feel that a, a more all-inclusive and final solution is needed. We need a, uh, an international authority to govern the planet. The popes have called for that. Pope Francis is no different. He's advocating for this. He said it in his encyclical Laudato Si. Well, now you have the Parliament of World's Religions working with the United Nations, and what they say the goal was? To implement the Sustainable Development Goals. What's sustainable development? World government. It's a 2,000-year-old prophecy happening right now. We don't have to sit here and guess, well, let me see. I wonder if we're in the end time. No, no. We're way off into the end time. We're actually at the culmination of all of this. So make sure you know your Bible. Make sure you got this stuff right because there will be people that try to coerce you in the future to move off of that. And that's something you cannot do in the end time. God bless you all. See you next time. This has been End of the Age, brought to you by the faithful partners of End Time Ministries. If you're not currently a partner with End Time Ministries, or if you would like more information, we invite you to call us at 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463, or visit us online at endtime.com. Thank you for watching. If you liked this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel and like our Facebook page.